Welcome to Techie Books Hangout. We are here with author Simon Rose, who is the author of our, our upcoming book, his upcoming book, Techie Publication. Flashback. Can you see that? There we go. Look at that. Almost professional, not quite. So, hi, Simon. Hello. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for having me here in the Tyke Books <laughs> studio. I guess in Calgary, Alberta. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So let's tell us a little bit about you, and then we will go into the book. About me? What would you like to know? Well, well, you've obviously written other books in this one. So. I didn't even know that was here. <laughs> yes, I have written some books. Obviously, we're here today to talk about uh, Flashback, which has been uh, will be published by Taiki Books uh, this month, I believe. It's it's yeah. pretty soon now. Um, these books here are ones that have been published over the years. There were, um, I suppose, eight other books altogether. There's uh, there, these are time travel, uh, science fiction, fantasy, historical fiction uh, adventures for um, middle grade readers and and, and young uh, adult readers. And the first one came out that was that one came out in two thousand three, and they've been on a regular basis since then. And I'm also um, I'm also the author of. Uh, uh, non-fiction books. I do a lot of educational non-fiction books for, for for children. I've written a guide for writers, tips and advice, and things like that. I do teaching at schools. I do stuff at the universities. I'm I'm a busy person, really. How how I found time to do this interview, I don't <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. And before we go on, just reminding people that if you're on the uh, YouTube channel, you can write your questions, and Simon will answer them. There is a bit of delay, so we may not get to it. As soon as you write them, but so you know. So let's go a little bit over flashback. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about the book without getting too spoilery, because you want people to get it. No, I don't want to. I don't want people to 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 know all about the story and, and not obviously buy the book. Um, but uh, this is a story. Just uh, I suppose a bit the story behind the story to some degree. Uh, it was one of the first ideas I ever had for for uh, for, for a novel, but. Um, like most uh, writers, I guess, I it, 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 it sometimes uh, it takes a while to, to get the rest of it. And I had the basic concept. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's really, a, I suppose, more of a ghost story than anything else. Uh, it's 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 a ghost story with uh, uh, elements of other paranormal things and evil scientists and uh, uh, experiments and laboratories and things like that. And a, a hint of time travel thrown in too. So it's got. Uh, I can't tell you anymore. That'd be that'd be too much. <laughs> so we won't mention government cover-ups. <laughs> well, if I mention government cover-ups, then th this interview could probably be terminated by by men in dark suits uh, coming into your studio in your home. We we wouldn't want that. You said it was one of the first books you wrote, but you haven't published it. So well, one of the first ideas, yes. I mean, the first ideas. I mean, just to, just to look at this sign here, the, the, this one here, which is called the Alchemist's Portrait, which is about a, a, a boy who travels in time through paintings, and this one here about a, a kid who has adventures in his own superhero comic book collection, the Emerald Curse. Here, this one. Um, those were, the, I suppose, the first couple of ideas I had for stories, as well as this one that's become become flashback but sometimes it takes a while to develop the story it's a very complicated plot or something so um, it, it just took a while to, to work it all out and, uh, and I'm very uh, grateful and thankful that uh, Taiki uh, liked the book and, and want to uh, want to publish it I'm looking forward to it uh, being out there in the marketplace so <laughs> you gave me a list of questions I gave you a list of questions <laughs> so what is the inspiration the inspiration uh, what for this particular one? Yeah. Well, as I say, it's a ghost story uh, to some degree. There's a ghost elements in it, but really, I think the the inspiration for for flashback in the first place was more um, uh, sort of post hypnotic regression and things like that, psychics and previous lives and all that sort of. Stuff. That's where it first came from, uh, and then it all went on from there. Really, how how psychics uh, and people with paranormal powers might be manipulated by shadowy government people for for nefarious purposes. So I think that's really more or less where it came from in the first place. Yes. So most of your books, if not all of them, have a certain amount of time travel. Why is time travel so interesting to you? Well, I don't know really, see, because in some ways time travel is a thing of the past. <laughs> yeah, well. Also, <laughs> I've always liked time travel stories. I mean, if I think back to some of the inspirations in my 
life for, for movies and, and TV and all that sort of stuff. Really, when I was growing up, the original Star Trek series was was certainly a big influence on, on me as I was growing up. And the episodes I remember most are probably the time travel ones. And I also, I'm a history major. I have a degree in history and things. So that all combines together, I suppose. Um, to want to write time travel stories. They're not all time travel stories, but there is an element of time travel in three or four of them, I guess. And um, and, and I suppose the, there's, there's a couple here. These would be more historical fiction, but time travel's involved. So <laughs> I just like it. I just think it's so good. I don't want to do it all the time. And uh, I, uh, all the time. <laughs> I'll probably take a break from time travel stories for, for, for a little while. The one I'm working on now is not a time travel story. But it's just one of my favorite topics. I, I'm interested in time travel stories, the paranormal, historical fiction, ancient mysteries and civilizations, comic books, superheroes. All these things have been used to some degree in these books in the past. So let's go over your writing process. I, I mean, writing for young kids to a certain extent is the same as writing for adults. Mm -hmm. So do you have a um, sort of a timeline worked out written out or do you just go? Uh, well, it's, it's been mostly been, I've had an outline in, re in recent memory. The first book that uh, came out, which was The Alchemist Portrait back in 2003, I did not have an outline for that. I just thought like a lot of people probably do. I have a wonderful idea for a story. I'm going to start at the beginning and work through to the end. And I, it, it took a long time to, to write the book because I kept getting new ideas and going back and erasing chapters I'd written and changing my mind about things. Um, it does make more sense to, to have a plan, and all the books since then I've had an outline or a plan of the story at least um, to begin with. And uh, I don't know how many, it depends on the length of the story, but maybe the uh, it's sort of one paragraph for every chapter of the book, um, three or four thousand words sometimes. And uh, does it change as you write the book? Yes, it does. Uh, but you've got the skeleton of the story, uh, the basic structure, and I think that really helps you to keep on track. So I've, I have tried to do that with most of the books. The one I'm working on now is has it's sort of a combination of the two. It has a it has an outline, but I keep getting new ideas as well. Uh, so, but most of the time, yes, try and I try and stick to an outline just to keep me on track. But it can change during the process. So do your do your characters occasionally decide to not go where you want them to? Yes, they do, or they not 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 so much go where they want them to. They sometimes change. Yes, I mean the the uh, the the sweet innocent young woman suddenly becomes a traitor who kills everyone. Yes, or something <laughs> like that. Or the the person you expect to kill anyone turns out to be in love with the with the woman, and 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 they get married and live happily ever after at the end. But then she kills him, or something like that. <laughs> Things can change, and that and that's healthy, I think. Not for the characters, but it's healthy for the author. So how long does it take to write? your average book? Well, it depends really. I mean, some people might say because they're for younger children, they would be easier to write and quicker to write. No, but, but the, um, well, so, yes, yeah, some people say that sometimes with uh, picture books, I think you get these uh, people who aren't in the know, like I suppose, in the business, I suppose, like you and I would say, well, um, picture books, well, they, they don't take long to write. There's not many words, but that's not the case. It depends out, uh, on all sorts of different factors. Some of these books I've written in a, in a short period of time. Sometimes they take a year, you know, or two years. Sometimes it depends how what else you're doing and also how complex the thing is. So uh, I think uh, if you've got a nice tight outline and everything, it can be written in uh, a very short space. Now you might write a, a novel for this age range in, couple of months but sometimes it might take you a, a year it, it, it all depends yeah and I find picture books I tend to equate them to comics and graphic novels mm -hmm. which you know take however long they take the same idea because you're telling the story with the picture as well as the story mm -hmm. so you have to combine the two but none of yours have picture books at all the Emerald Curse, uh, there has some pictures in it that the publisher uh, put in there because it's about a, a boy who gets trapped in a comic book universe. So the idea was to uh, add some illustrations from, from, from an artist to because of the theme of the story. But apart from that, no, they don't have pictures in apart from obviously on the covers. Um, what type of research do you do for some of your books? Like the one you wrote for us, it only goes back, it goes back about 20 years or so. Shh, don't tell people. But we were alive then. <laughs> the ones, for example, the the heretics. Mm -hmm. The historical ones, yeah. 
you weren't alive in that period unless you're older than you let on. But. No, I, w I was not alive in the Middle Ages. Uh, some people might think I was, but I, I wasn't alive in the Middle Ages. So, uh, yes, I've had to do, I had to do research for the historical fiction ones. The source was Letterboxd there and the Heretic's Tomb are both medieval stories uh, set in the... Heretic's Tomb is at the time of the Black Death. The source was Letterboxd is set in the late 15th century. And for those, lots of research had to be done into uh, clothing, castles, how uh, what sort of saddles they used, weaponry, and also about uh, not so much who was who, uh, but also who was where. For example, if you've got a, um, a a lead character like in the Sorcerer's Letter box, you've got Richard the Third, King of England, and he's a character in the story. He appears in the story, and you've got to make sure that if if you're saying it's it's June the first. 1483 and he's going to come into the Tower of London and say something you better make sure he was in England on that date or if, <laughs> that he was alive you know because although um, the, the readers the children who read the stories are not um, going to know not going to criticize that not look into it too much reviewers will librarians teachers and people who review books will look into those details so you've got to get them right and that was just for the historical ones but even for the for the say even for the clone conspiracy which is a science fiction evil scientist laboratory type story and laboratories and scientists are in a flashback as well you have to do research into that uh into what laboratories might look like and just to make it plausible not so much checking facts that you do with history it's got to be well this laboratory has to look or sound authentic when the reader's reading about it. Yes, scientists in, in lab coats with clipboards and flashing lights and computer consoles and things it has to be described correctly. So you have to do research for those as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you've written your book. Mm -hmm. It's all nice and ready. How many times do you edit it and review it after? Oh dear, let me think. Well, I know with the and first that's one. Even before it gets to, say, Margaret, and then. Yes. Then well, I know that with the first one, again, going back to that, the only because I, I, when I visit schools and also stuff at the university, I'll, I'll take the manuscript for the first book with me. I have a copy of the first one. I have a copy of the one I sent to the publisher, which is huge and mm -hmm. huge, huge. Uh, early version and then an edited version with editor's notes on it and everything in, in pen in, in, in by hand and with that one I believe there were 28 versions of the story uh, the 28th version and the 27th story uh, version of course were very similar but the difference between the first one and the 28th are, are quite a lot uh, but I think with the more recent ones with flashback for example there, there might be um, I spent a lot of time revising that and changing it around. We were making changes to that recently. I think we found something that was uh, that we both that Margaret and I both missed. I think just some little thing, but I think it's very important for any writer if they're going to send something into a publisher to do all the editing beforehand uh, as much as they can. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, people have to realise that yes, publishers. And editors will ask for changes or they'll suggest changes and things like that. But you've got to make sure it's as good as uh, uh, you can make it before it goes in. So I tried to make it uh, as good as possible before it went to Taiki, uh, knowing that they'd ask for some alterations. But yeah. And that's the other thing that has to be realized. Um, we've had it occasionally. When you, even when you think it's perfect, you have to be willing to work with the editor to make change and not say, no, this is it or else. Because they'll call you on it. They'll go, okay, fine, or else. Exactly. So I've, I've tried my best to, to, to make it uh, uh, as, as perfect as possible uh, before it goes in, knowing that something may, may be changed. And it, it, in my experience, and if, you've, if you do all that, it's very rare that the publisher is going to say, well, we'd like to turn the male character into a female green alien from, yeah, from Saturn. Yeah, they're not usually you know? asking for major changes. Some of it no. is thesaurus changes. Mm -hmm. like you've got this particular word in there too many times to mm -hmm. you know, yeah. change it to something else. It's very important. I think. I think people don't. I think with the advent of uh, self-publishing, uh, not so much self-publishing that's printed, mostly self-publishing with e-books. I think a lot of people think, well, I've written a book. I'll just put a hit upload, and I'm now a published author. And they haven't bothered with the editing uh, and things. And it's really important to do all that. Editing and revising is. Uh, is it tedious? Uh, yes. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Necessary to have an editor. So you've done ghostwriting. Ghostwriting. Yeah. Uh, what about ghosts? You mean? Is that what it says? 
<laughs> no, no. I think no. I think uh, I've, I've uh, ghostwriting in in terms of uh, writing other people's um, uh, books for them and everything. Yeah, I'm, I I advertise that. Uh, I, I I will do that if people want me to. Uh, but I've mostly done. Um, Collaboration work, I suppose, with other writers. I've done quite a bit of that in the last two, three, or four years. I think I've been more like a writing coach, I suppose, and editing things for people. Um, I am not uh, doing the editing uh, as a professional editor would, particularly. It's more like substantive editing, I suppose. And um, what we're doing is we're uh, uh, making sure that, uh, so let's say, you've written a book and everything. I'm going through it with you to to work with you to see if it, to make it fit to send into a publisher, I guess. Uh, so that you wouldn't be embarrassed about it and things like that. So, yeah, that's what I would do with that. So I do a fair amount of that. Now, I just noticed that the Google one is right, but for whatever reason, the YouTube one is mirroring your poster. Oh, my goodness me. My I am I am actually backwards here, apparently, on YouTube. But uh, uh, please, my name is not written backwards normally uh, on, on my books, and the books are not read from, from back to front. Yes. And believe it or not, we went through a lot of trouble to make it right way, and it's right way on our camera. We did, but <laughs> uh, right technology you never can tell. You never can tell. Um, I'm just going to leave it. <laughs> Otherwise, it it's a technical be. hitch, but one we can deal with. That's right. It's a Simon-Rose.com. <laughs> yes, I do have a website. I suppose, well, if in case I forget to mention, I do have a website that most of the stuff I, uh, that about my books and the things I do and everything is, including all the nonfiction books, are all on the website. You can find out all sorts of things like that. I'm also, of course, in all the usual places: Twitter, and Facebook, and Pinterest, and LinkedIn, and Google Plus, and all the other things. Uh, so I, I'm easy, easy to find online in the in the digital world. So if you feel like stalking Simon. <laughs> I guess you could, yes. I guess you could. Yeah. Um, so, let us go on to screenplays and scripts. Oh my goodness me! I, I do, do I have to talk about that? Oh my goodness me! I didn't. I didn't write a script for this interview. Is that what I was supposed to have done? I don't write scripts for the interview. No. You can actually tell. <laughs> Now I've done some stuff on that. I've worked with uh, uh, some uh, an organisation running uh, summer camps for for students, and I've done some drama work with them, and written scripts and plays for the for for, for children, uh, middle grade children, for, uh, or worked with them to produce the plays over the last four or five years. These have mostly been um, uh, sort of fairy tale stories, secret agents, superheroes, that kind of stuff over the years. But also, I've been doing. Um, I've been doing some work in in, in recent uh, memory with uh, with people to work on screenplays. I think it's quite a new venture, but I'm hoping it'll it'll come into something. It'll be quite nice to to do something a bit different, uh, and it's always nice to learn about different types of writing. Yeah. So why younger audiences? Why what? When you write, you tend to write for the younger. Audience. I do yes, but you read Flashback and thought it was wonderful. Yes, but I also said I'm a little old for it too. Well, I wouldn't say you're a little old. Uh, that's <laughs> okay, not very, I'm a lot old. No, that's not a very nice thing to say about yourself. But <laughs> anyways, I, I don't know. I think for writing for younger audiences. Well, I think when I first started out with with with, with when, when thought, well, I could probably do this. You know, not for a living, but certainly had ideas for stories. Um, it was uh, the first children's books I came into contact with as a parent. Uh, were obviously little kids' stories, picture books, and little board books, and those sort of things. And although some of them were quite good, some of them were poor, you know, as, as in any industry, I suppose. Uh, and I, I thought, well, surely I could probably write a story that's better than this one. <laughs> and, and so I, but I, I'm not an illustrator. I don't, I don't uh, draw things. And I, I just, at first I thought I'd write, I, I thought I would be writing stories for fairy tale type things for children who were, you know, six and seven years old or something like that. Um, but then I read these, uh, these books, uh, Harry, Harry something, what was it called? Harry... Potter, I think his name was. It's a long time ago. Now. Have you heard of those books? He plants. Yeah. He plants plants. He does. Harry Potter. He pots plants. Yes, yes. But <laughs> yes, I read. I read the Harry Potter the first one. I, I'd heard about this uh, this book in some sort of magazine in some writers group I was in. And it was all about this controversy about this book that was leading children astray or something like that. And I thought, what is this? I thought it was an author called Harry Potter. And then I saw the book at the airport in the bookstore, I think, and bought the book. And uh, read it, and I thought, well, wow, this is this is uh, this is, uh, this is influenced me in the sense I didn't want I did not want to write about well wizards and magic wands and, and and the classic fantasy stuff and dragons, nothing at all. I wasn't interested in that, but it was just the age range I think interested me uh, in terms of the, the age groups that's just slightly before that. 
Yeah. Would be things like uh, I suppose the Magic Treehouse, where they, uh, would, where in the Magic Treehouse books, they the, the characters they go back in time to say medieval times and watch a joust or something. And there's no danger. They learn a bit about the time period, but they don't have any real adventures in terms of where they're threatened. But in the Harry Potter ones, although you knew that the characters were going to survive in those early ones, you knew the characters were going to get away and, and, and live. Uh, they were in substantial danger at times. It was quite, and there was a level of scariness in those stories. I thought, well, I think this is the sort of level I want to write for. And my own children were, then were, were much younger than than the, than that. They were sort of like five and three or something like that. And so I was interested in writing for that age group. And then, of course, an important thing that people uh, tell you when you're writing is write what you know. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, unless there's some inventions I don't know about, people cannot travel in time or to other dimensions or to other planets and things like that in real life so people might say well how can you write well you know well it's really writing about what you're interested in if you're interested in hockey then write a book about hockey if you're interested in if you're experienced with uh, uh, the equestrian world you can write about horses if you're interested in uh, boats and sailing you can include that in your stories and for me it was a case of well, I like time travel, I like superheroes, other dimensions, the paranormal, ancient civilizations, mysteries, this sort of thing. That's what I will focus on. And so in that sense, those first books were about time travel and history and superheroes and the ghost story, previous life, reincarnation-y thing. Uh, so that's what interested me. Yeah. Now I'm going to do something that I totally silly. If you were a fruit, what kind of fruit would you be? Uh, the thing you asked me not to ask you. The thing that I was, I was asked, I asked you not to ask. If I was a, 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 a fruit, not a vegetable. If I was a fruit, what sort of fruit would I be? Yes, keeping in mind tomatoes are fruits. I don't know if I'd want to be a tomato, to be honest. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, bananas, I guess, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Is that because you're a little bananas? That's the thing. I think. I think. I think maybe yes. You have to be. And of course, uh, it, uh, it, 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 I, it, there's an R in banana when I say it. Of course, banana. You see, that's the thing. But yes, I am a little bit bananas. Uh, I think, and I think bananas are quite a silly thing. They're a silly fruit, <laughs> as opposed to the round-shaped apples and oranges. And bananas are a bit silly. And I am, of course, a silly person, and a bit strange and bananas and crazy. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to to write these books. So, since you said you said banana with an R, let's talk about your background. <gasps> okay. Where are you from? Well, I'm from the United Kingdom originally, and uh, I now live in where we are now in Calgary, Alberta. I've been here since 1990, actually. So, uh, the area I came from in England is uh, the county of Derbyshire, which is in the, I suppose, the most the middle of England. If you were looking at the map, it'd be about halfway between the south coast and the Scottish border, I suppose. The nearest big town to me is a town called Chesterfield in Derbyshire. Uh, the nearest big city would be Sheffield, but the, it's, it's the town would be Chesterfield. That's where I, I was sort of born and raised and things like that. And sometimes these these things come into the stories in the um, in this one, uh, the Sphere of Septimus, which came out with a, a different publisher. <laughs> uh, recently, uh, that book uh, in the beginning of the story, it does uh, uh, the setting is in the county of Derbyshire and it's in a uh, uh, small village in the in the Peak District National Park in the Derbyshire countryside and there's old churches and old buildings and castle and things like that in there and it's ba it is based a lot on, on childhood memories of that um, uh, part of the world yeah cool so I know you've written books on writing hmm. so give give tips and tricks and stuff tips and tricks and what kind of advice would you give to people especially if they want to write this age group well i think i think uh, one of the things we, we mentioned earlier was uh, I, I would definitely think about um uh, the outline thing is important. I think it's important to do an outline of stories uh, before you start writing them. Uh, and definitely the editing and revision is very important. And again, it's something we mentioned earlier, write what you know. If you're, if you're interested in, if you want to write a story that's a sports-related story for younger people and you know about, you don't think you have to know about the sport, know about it, or everything to do with hockey or something, but it is if, if you're interested in that, if you're enthusiastic about it, it's going to be a lot easier uh, to, to write the story. Another thing you've got to do as well, you've got to, you have to have an idea. I do meet people quite a lot of these. I do book signings and things locally. Uh, or you just meet people in general, and sometimes people say, oh, really? You're an author? Really? 
children's book. That's very interesting. I'm writing a, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a children's book, and I say to them, "Oh, really? What's it about?" And they say, "Oh, I don't know yet." <laughs> oh, okay. So you have an idea? Oh, no, I don't have an idea. But I, when the time comes, they expect they're going to get the idea into their head, and they're going to write a children's book. You have to have an idea, and sometimes the ideas seem a little bit strange. And uh, I, I say I've been lucky enough to have you know, nine books here that I've had ideas for, and they've come to fruition. But uh, I also have other ones that are that I'm working on in various stages of development. Some of them are very well developed story ideas, and some of them is where I've just got the premise. Okay, there's this kid he travels in time through paintings, and that's all you've got. And and I've, you know you might have had some ideas like for years, and uh, and never done anything with them. So I think you've got to, you've certainly got to have ideas and be able to develop them. But at the other end of the scale, uh, you've got to be able to deal with, of course, deal with rejection. Rejection. People are rejected all the time uh, by authors and in life in general, I suppose. And you have to be able to um, deal with that. And I think some people aren't able to do that. They think that, uh, well, I've written my wonderful work. It's taken me 10 years and now no one likes it. Well, that's the way Just because 10 publishers don't like it doesn't mean that the 11th one won't. Um, there's been some famous well-known names whose books have been rejected. I think you're probably aware of lots of them, like Stephen King, I think, was well, rejected was lots of times. that I've heard talking. He said, yeah, I, I submitted my book to like 20 different editors, and then I went around and I went back and submitted it to the first one again because fads change as mm -hmm. well, and then they, they accepted it, the same one that rejected it. Too. That's right, and I say famous people. There's a there's lots of places online where you can see the the, the J.K. Rowling is one that most people know about, rejected by so many people, because um, wizards and dragons. It's old hat. Children aren't reading about that these days. Say Stephen King, I mentioned earlier, John Grisham. Um, I think he was uh, was it. Um, uh, well, there's a few of them anyway. The, the famous people who have been rejected so many times. Ernest Hemingway and. Now, lots of these people have been rejected by by publishers, and that thing you mentioned, they're sending it to the person uh, again, it, is an interesting thing because they were just having a bad day that day, and then, mm -hmm. and then the second time, they or maybe they weren't even in the office. Their assistant looked at it. It's hard to tell, and uh, and fads change and fashions change too. I know that um, if during the height of Potter mania, if you were thinking, "Wow, I've been influenced by Harry Potter. I'm going to write a book about wizards or wizard school or just something to do with magic," by the time that got to the publisher say in 2015 or 2012 or whenever it was, and they suddenly think, well, the, yeah, but the wizard thing is gone. It's like if you were writing about uh, vampires now because you're influenced by all the vampire stuff, then though that seems to have gone now and we're now into zombies. Yeah, I'm so over zombies. And The Hunger Games is, is, is hot, of course, at the moment. But again, the, the, these are the movies from the book that came out a couple of years ago. So whether the dystopian thing is still... Uh, a thing that publishers are looking for, and I don't know. So yeah, things do do, do change. Yeah, how we got onto that, I'm not sure, but um, um, yes, we got onto that by rejecting. Yes, I was rejected. I was rejected. But now you've got you've just basically got to have quite a thick skin with regards to that. And uh, although uh, there are lots of publishers, just like there are lots of people in the world, and if you are rejected by one publisher. Um, it doesn't mean that they're rejecting you as a person. They're rejecting your work, the, and that particular work. That doesn't mean that all your other books are terrible. They're rejecting the, this story. Your first novel is not for them, but the next publisher it could be for them. I mean, Taiki books are, 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 are publishing flashback. Uh, other people might not like it, and the same with these other stories uh, that I've written. Some, they're, not, they're not for every. You've hit the, the publisher at the right time, and they think, yes. I'd like to do a story about cloning, and this was this is the one, and I like it. I've read the outline, I've read the mm -hmm. uh, the text, and I think you have to have a, a reasonably thick skin with it and keep going. And uh, one thing I, I should mention this though quickly about the rejection thing is, uh, and it's in the book I did, the tips book and everything. Uh, there is a, a, a thing uh, that you could call constructive rejection. You might sometimes be very fortunate in that the editor, instead of sending you the form letter with the stamp, with the reject stamp on it, you may get a letter back or the manuscript back with lots of notes that are really substantial notes about what's not wrong with your story, but suggestions and everything. And that can be extremely useful. And you think, oh, okay, I can move on. And this is free advice from a qualified person. And now I can send it to somebody else. Also, don't be afraid of sending it to smaller press like mm. yeah you have the bane and the dogs and the tours and whatnot and 
everybody's sending to them, so you're stuck to get lost in the pile. So don't be afraid to send it to the smaller presses, like the Taiki or the, you know. Yeah, I I, yeah, that's something I've mentioned to people before as well. People I've worked with in the substantial, substantive editing thing and helping them, coaching them through their own books, uh, they, they're all very much uh, often hung up on, you know, Harper Collins and Penguin and, 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 and all these other people. And it's like, well, yes, but the smaller, especially in the digital age when there's going to be an ebook and this, mm -hmm. an audio book and things as well, the small press is, it, you're, you're, you're still going to be a published author. And um, most, uh, even small presses these days, they'll have an ebook, they'll have a website, they'll have a, a, a presence on Amazon and Facebook and everything else. So your book's not going to get lost because it's with a little tiny publisher. No. Yeah. And sometimes it does go better because um, with the big publishers, not always, I'm not going to say it always does better. With the big publishers, because they're publishing hundreds of books a year instead of a dozen books a year, and it's easier to get lost in the shop. And you probably have a, a closer personal relationship with a smaller publisher too. I mean, I'm a Taiki Books have their own, you know, sophisticated studio here in Calgary, <laughs> <laughs> where we are right now. But no, the thing is, uh, most of the time you may not, uh, if if your publisher is in another part of the country, you might not ever meet the publisher. You might meet your editor once. They could uh, be in another country. Period. That's right. They could be in a completely different uh, different country with a smaller uh, publisher. You might have. No, it's not the case of having more control over your book but you might have more of a say in the cover you might be asked for suggestions and changes more often from the uh, in the editing process you might meet the publicity people the editing people the uh, the, the accountants you could meet lots of people if, if it's a small publisher in your own city so that gives you more of a personal feel more of a family atmosphere perhaps i don't know something like that so yes the small press i would not tell people to avoid that at all so You've been picking on my little office enough. Let's talk about your office. What does your workspace look like? Well, I must admit, without being too derogatory about this <laughs> studio that we're in here, this is this is my much tidier. No, now my in in my own home, I have an I have an office that I do uh, work. I do a lot of work. I do all. I'm in there all the time. You know, apart from. Uh, when I'm not fully writing something or other, and um, yeah, it's, it's an office in in the home, and it's got uh, bookshelves and computers and printers and all all the other stuff that you would imagine. And um, I spend uh, as much time in there as you expect with, for someone who's constantly writing uh, novels and nonfiction books and dealing with email and and um, doing really really important things on Facebook uh, <laughs> and Twitter and things rather than just playing games and things. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's against me or not, since I don't play Facebook yet. No, but some people do. Some people are on Facebook all the time and do a lot of. I, 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 I have, yeah, I have, I have, um, I have a, a Facebook page for myself, and I have a Facebook page for me as an author, and I also run a a group on Facebook called um, uh, Children's Authors and Illustrators on Facebook, which has close to five thousand. Uh, members and I, I, I sort of, I'm on there a fair bit policing it and uh, and a bit from spam. Hmm? Is that the Squibby? No, no, this is just the one I run. I've been running oh, okay. it for about five years, and it's uh, we have some very good discussions, and I police it very rigorously for uh, for spam and people self promoting and, and things. You'll buy my book now, sort of follow this link. I, I'm on there every day for that, and um, and also on the same note, I should point this out, shouldn't I? That I also have. Um, a YouTube channel of my own, of course, which is called Fantasy Fiction Focus, in which I uh, interview uh, writers, uh, not children's writers. These are all um, people who are uh, writing science fiction and fantasy, uh, paranormal, horror, uh, uh, graphic novels, comic book people, illustrators and artists, even people involved in film, uh, rather than the f uh, people who are doing children's or, or young adult books. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's I, I started this thing back in, earlier this year i guess just beginning of uh january or mid-january or something and it's uh it, you know we're running interviews on a regular basis it seems to be going quite well so far so if people want to meet you in person and shake your hand where are you going to be in the next few months my goodness me well i i do all sorts of things Some i of Appearances. I know public appearances. I don't know if is, is it wise to mention this because there'll be screaming fans everywhere. But I'll take the risk. I think um, I do. Uh, I'm, I'm in Calgary, of course, and I do. Uh, I live here, and I do book signings locally at some of the bookstores um, in uh, at Chapters and Indigo in Calgary. But also, along with Taiki Books, the famous <laughs> Calgary publisher, I will be appearing at the Calgary 
what's it called? Comic and Entertainment Expo, which takes place in April. I believe it's April 16, 17, 18, 19 uh, in Calgary down at the Stampede Grounds. And we've, we've shared a booth for a, a couple, few years now with, with Taiki and some other writers and, uh, and publishers. And that's, uh, I, I will be there uh, uh, chit-chatting with people who come to the booth and signing books if people buy them and all sorts of things like that. Um, and also people can meet me electronically all the time. They can meet me on uh, on my website and things like that. And I do, I, I, I visit schools on a regular basis to, um, to do workshops for children and for young adults as well, as well as in the community. So I'm, I'm, I'm out and about quite a bit when I'm, uh, when I'm not writing. It gives me three minutes, and I'll know what table we're at. Cause we have it listed. Uh, I believe it's booth fourteen ten and fifteen ten. Yeah. It's in the it's at the uh, uh, more or less in the middle uh, of the of the, the back aisle uh, of the of the of uh, the BMO Center, quite close to the area where people go in to have interviews, uh, say uh, autographs. Uh, photographs and autographs with the with the rich and famous, yeah. So yes. we have a good spot, I think. It's been quite good and it's very busy, isn't it? We, we, we quite enjoy each other's company and things. We all get along very well yeah. and it's it's quite busy and we have a lot of fun while we're there too. Yes, so, so we share it with a number of people. There's people yeah we do there's a say there's a, other publishers there there's a uh, artists and, and other writers and things and we we call ourselves the science fiction and fantasy alliance yeah uh just because we needed a one name and we've got a banner and everything and people find us easy to find so it's gonna be a lot of fun i think yeah there we go and we have been at this almost 40 minutes so my goodness me wrap up do you want to remind everyone of your various websites and stuff and well uh yes i i think i think we can do that well i suppose first of all we should mention that the uh, the new book with taiki is uh, i'm not quite sure of the exact availability date but it is all done and the, and the and the covers on here and everything and it's all edited and everything it's going to be printed i must pretty soon pretty soon next couple of weeks it's, it's certainly yeah. getting the arc looked at now yeah. and then it'll be Certainly be available. We'll have it at the Comic Expo, oh, definitely. Um, and I'll have copies of my own. It'll be it'll be out and about online. There's an audio version, I think, and Probably an Probably will be coming out end of May, mid June. Yeah, it's when the audio book will be out. So sometime before summer. Right? Yeah, and there'll be an ebook and a print version, so people will be able to get that. Uh, and those will be out. In yeah. Couple yeah. Weeks and I'll obviously I'll be promoting on all my various social media things, so it, people will know when it's out and about and ready. Uh, the website, which may be written backwards, but it's right there, simon-rose.com. They can find all about me and the books and everything like that. Uh, I am on, of course, as well, Twitter and Facebook and things. You can find the you know the links from from the the website and everything. So I try and be as visible as possible um, online. So yep. yeah. Perfect, thank you. We're not having an interview in April because uh, we're getting ready for Comic Expo. Right, okay. But, and I haven't lined up a author for me yet, so. We should do live interviews at the Comic Expo. Okay, you go right ahead. I'm going <laughs> to be standing at the table selling books. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Sometimes people say, oh, you should do this and that and the other. And did you see this at the Comic Expo? People ask us these things all the time, don't they? Yes. And it's like, well, not really. They said, I'm too busy. They say, oh, really? Well, what are you doing? Well, I'm an exhibitor. I'm at the table. And really, it is horrendously busy at times. And we have to talk to as many people as possible who come to our table. That's why we're there. We're not there to let's... Um, Let's have a booth at the Comic Expo. Let's pay a lot of money for it. And then uh, uh, within 30 minutes of the show opening, we think, well, I'm going to have a wander around for two yeah. hours and have some lunch and talk to people in other booths. And then people are coming by and there's no one there to sign their book and you've wasted your money. So it's a working yes. uh, four days for us and very busy. So, But we enjoy it. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's worthwhile, I think, um, to do that. So, yeah. So you have no other questions. There was a lot of questions on that list, you know. There was, but we covered a lot of it know, before we. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again, Simon. Thank you. And we will talk to you later. You probably will. <laughs>